years. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, gut-derived ammonia, uh, predominantly ammonia is derived from the gut in human beings, by, from food, uh, bacteria, and also from amino acid metabolism, which is used by gut epithelia. And uh, the ammonia from the uh, gut is predominantly drained by portal system into the liver, where it is disposed of as urea. And uh, ammonia also maintains the amino acid homeostasis in many other organs. And uh, in liver is the major site of its disposal, as well as sending uh, ammonia to the circulation to various organs for production of various amino acids, which are necessary for the uh, various organ functions. Once liver is damaged, depending upon the degree of liver damage and the acuteness of liver damage, the disposal of ammonia and amino acid uh, homeostasis by uh, uh, ammonia get disturbed, which causes uh, multiple organ dysfunction and liver disease, which phenotypically we all see. Initially, uh, uh, ammonia has been found to be a major neurotoxin, particularly in acute liver uh, failure. When the liver is suddenly damaged, there is no time for ammonia to be adapted by other organs and ammonia level rises very rapidly in the blood. And it has been has seen in both animal as well as human as a major, major neurotoxins. And recently, there are certain publications which uh, identifies it as a good prognostic marker. However, the role of ammonia in chronic liver disease, uh, including acute and chronic liver failure and cirrhotics, compensated and decompensated cirrhotics, are questionable as far as prognosis or therapy is concerned, because it is not correlated with uh, neurological dysfunctions or not has been correlated with other organ dysfunction. However, uh, uh, the recent story and evidence suggests that may not be true, and uh, ammonia metabolism in liver disease may be very vital to understand uh, the future manifestation of liver disease, even in chronic liver disease. And lastly, uh, we'll discuss about in fatty liver disease, which is the major liver disease, whether uh, ammonia recently has been hypothesized that uh, in this uh, uh, fatty liver disease, it may have a pathogenic role for its progression to fibrogenesis. Uh, before starting the uh, ball rolling, I will just remind you the background uh, of uh, ammonia production and its metabolism. We know gut epithelium, which has a very rapid turnover, uses predominantly glutamine, the amino acid, 50% of our amino acid in the blood are glutamine, derived uh, predominantly from the food. And uh, uh, glutamine is uh, broken down by glutamine. Glutamine is an enzyme which is present in intestinal epithelium into glutamate and ammonia. This is the major source. Besides, uh, from the food, various amino acid metabolism as well as uh, from the urea, which diffuses into the gut by bacteria and urease, particularly in the large intestine. And all this ammonia goes to the, uh, 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 through the portal circulation to the liver. And we know there are five important enzymes, carbamyl phosphate synthase, ornithine transcarbamylase, arginine succinate synthase, arginine succinate lyase, and arginase. And uh, these five enzymes are very essential for metabolism of ammonia and also maintaining the amino acid, various form of amino acid, which also circulate and maintain the homeostasis. Now think when the liver fails, all this mechanism gets disturbed. I will uh, 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 request you to re remember this, particularly carbamyl phosphate synthase and ornithine transcarbamylase enzymes, are very important enzymes. Because recently in fatty liver disease, lipotoxicity has been shown to cause mutation in the gene of OTC and CPS, causing dysfunctional enzymes and intrahepatic uh, ammonia metabolism being compromised in fatty liver disease. That is the hypothesis in fatty liver disease. Now, obviously, when there is a liver failure, uh, the functional liver reserve is low, but it is variable depending upon the rapidity with which the liver damage occurs and the amount of the severity of liver damage. Once this happens, obviously, urea genesis is uh, decreased 
and increased ammonia goes into the circulation. Now, obviously, neuro neurological dysfunction because of ammonia was well known. We know ammonia can cross blood-brain barrier through uh, the uh, uh, astrocytic food processes through the potassium channel and reach the astrocyte where there is already glutamate as an amino acid which combines and forms glutamine which is hygroscopic and causes osmosis or uh, draws water into the astrocyte causing astrocytic swelling resulting in intracranial hypertension, hepatic encephalopathy and also sometimes uh, uh, coding of the brain stem to foramen magnum. And also ammonia ha also has been shown recently in both human as well as animal that it may upregulate hepatic stellate cells and increase fibrosis. And in the muscle, there is glutaminase and glutamine synthesis I will just discuss. And ammonia goes to muscle form glutamine. When ammonia increases, this hemostatic mechanism of glutamate and glutamine in the muscle get disturbed. And it may be partially responsible of abnormal protein synthesis inside the liver in presence of inflammation and upregulation of myostatin gene. This muscular atrophy or sar sarcopenia is well known. Now, uh, ammonia has been shown to decrease phagocytic function and phagocytic oxidative burst of particularly neutrophil innate immune system. And uh, you know, liver disease sepsis is a major problem. And ammonia recently in vitro has been shown to increase upregulate HSC proliferation and fibrogenesis. So it has multiple effects. So once the liver is damaged, the ammonia disposal is compromised and amino acid homeostasis is compromised. And uh, circulating ammonia has multiple effects on various organs. And uh, 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 as a result, which what we see is the phenotype. This is what exactly I was uh, <laughs> describing. Uh, ammonia disposal occurring through the urea cycle in the liver. And uh, uh, there are two enzymes, glutamine synthase and glutamine H, which are present in the muscles, in the brain, in the kidney, right? and other organs, and where actually ammonia is converted to glutamine or glutamine is broken down to ammonia and glutamate. And glutamate has also another molecule of ammonia. Glutamate is con consists of alpha-ketoglutarate alpha and ammonia. And alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase breaks glutamate into ammonia. So glutamine, in fact, contains two molecules of ammonia. So essentially, that's what I described. The gut-derived ammonia goes to the liver, where predominantly becomes urea, and goes to the kidney, and is excreted in the urea. Also, some amount of ammonia is excreted through the kidney. When the liver failure, this is an acidotic state. And for, to maintain acid-base balance, just reversal occurs in uh, a liver failure, where 70% of circulating ammonia is excreted, Instead, 70% of circulating ammonia in liver failure is go back to the circulation, perpetuating ammonia level and causing further problems. And uh, so what I have done, I have had divided the talk into e each type of liver disease, which you see in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Uh, first, coming to the ammonia in acute liver failure, Ammonia as a neurotoxin and pathogenetic mechanism is very well established in acute liver failure. And we know that I just explained that ammonia can cause cerebral edema and cerebral dysfunction and hepatic encephalopathy in ammonia. In fact, if you see the studies, various studies shows in acute liver failure, the ammonia levels are highest. And we know that acute liver failure is a catastrophic, fatal, severe complication, acute hepatitic illnesses and occurs within few hours or days. And usually in our part of the country, it is predominantly because of hepatitis viruses and uh, the uh, uh, complications like encephalopathy and outcome usually very short and a very stormy course within a week, invariably patient recovers or dies. And uh, when the liver damage is massive, the ammonia levels are extremely high. In comparison to a chronic liver disease, where this slow growing liver damage process allows, uh, even though there is a, a decrease in functional liver reserve, and there is a decrease in number of hepatocytes containing urea cycle, the slow rise in ammonia in such patients do not immediately cause a dramatic event like cerebral edema 
or overtensilopathy. But it causes neurotoxicity and causes other form of diseases, which I will just uh, show shows you. And acute chronic liver disease, which you know as ACL, that indeed ammonia can be very important pathogenic mechanism. Now, way back in 2006, we knew that ammonia rises in like, patients with acute liver failure. And we also observed that when ammonia rises and persists, people die. So we wanted to find out the predictive value of arterial ammonia for complication and outcome on acute liver failure. We were very surprised that a single measurement of ammonia at baseline can predict outcome. We found out by multivariate analysis that ammonia is an independent predictor of uh, mortality. And from a ROC curve, we could detect a cutoff level of 124 micromole as the cutoff level above which more patients die, about 80% die in comparison to about 23 or 24% of patients who has less than 124 micromoles. We also saw, uh, uh, documented the more frequently the complication like over cerebral edema, advanced encephalopathy, and seizure activity occurs in patients who have higher ammonia level. So we're very surprised that even the single value of ammonia in acute liver failure at baseline at hospital agents could predict. Subsequently, before that, Clemenson in hepatology in 2000, somewhere in 2002 or four, has shown that in human brain, uh, ammonia level is associated with brain herniation and death. And his cutoff was in his studies about 146 micromoles per liter. Subsequently to the, our publication, this is the King's College group who uh, analyzed their data and found the baseline admission ammonia levels are very important to predict in future progression of hepatic encephalopathy as well as mortality. And uh, uh, obviously showing that uh, even baseline ammonia can predict. But we observed that ammonia levels changes over a period of time amongst patients with acute liver failure who are managed in intensive care. And then we observed that those where baseline ammonia from the cutoff level we described, if it decreases over a period of time, the complication like cerebral edema, hepatic encephalopathy, and sepsis declined. They improved. And in those, if they did subside, the higher ammonia was measured over five days consecutively. And in those, it didn't decrease the cerebral edema, the advanced encephalopathy, increased infection persisted. Even those patients who didn't have cerebral edema, if their baseline ammonia level decreases, they never develop. Whereas the, if it increases, they develop cerebral edema after hospitalized. And similarly, the early encephalopathy advanced depending upon the degree of decline or uh, rise. Then when we evaluated this ammonia kinetic with the survival, we were also surprised. We found then in this study, a critical level of 122 micromoles per liter was important to predict mortality. And indeed, in about 300 patients, about more than half had high ammonia level but 43% of them survived. When we analyze who are those patients who survived, in them we found ammonia progressively decreased. And in them, the survival was about 72%. If it persisted above that level, the survival is 23%, about 80% died. This also same thing we documented those patients with admitted with early hepatic encephalopathy. And those with early hepatic encephalopathy, if ammonia declined, all survived. But if it doesn't decline, about two thirds of them died. So a kinetics of ammonia was very important. And we understood most of the prognostic model did now describe, despite ammonia being a very important neurotoxin, despite the fact that in acute liver failure, liver can regenerate because it's a naive liver on which there is an insult causing severe hepatitis and ammonia can be metabolized in the regenerated liver. It can be important prognostic marker. And it has not been included. And therefore, we designed another uh, study where we wanted to evaluate the prognostic marker. This is about 380 patients to divide a prognostic mark model 
we had a cohort derivation code of 244 and a validation code of 136. And obviously, we use the standard methods of statistical two of survival, non-survival, and uh, compared various factors, then a multivariate analysis. We found in day one, four important uh, factors are very uh, important independent predictor of outcome who are hep advanced hepatic encephalopathy, prolonged INR more than five, high arterial ammonia, and bilirubin lower, more than 50. But these things change. So when we followed up this patient over three days, we found on day three, their odds ratio to predict mortality is much more higher than day one. Each of these factors, each of these factors change over three days. And we normally, when we list this patient for transplant, we take a day or two to organize a, uh, a liver, particularly if you are having a life-related liver transplant, or if you are waiting for a disease DLT or disease donor liver transplant. So by that time, things have changed. And we know we unnecessarily transplant about quarter of the patients with acute liver failure. And liver transplant is a swap. It is another disease uh, in uh, lieu of uh, a severe liver disease. On day three, when I see, saw the odds ratio of each of these factors are much higher, then we actually took their beta integer, their mathematical strength, and rounded them as scores and you could derive a total score of six. And if you see, using this score, you can stratify the patients every day. And with these scores, the mortality has been depicted in the bar diagram. The blue color indicates the death rates and red color indicates the survival. If you see, if you had a alpha score out of this four factor, which is six score, about two or three, about 70 to 80% survive simply with medical therapy or conservative therapy. Whereas it reaches four, about 80% dies. And this score can stratify and this changes. So a person who has admitted with the alpha of six can become one over three days and a patient who has been admitted with one can become five or six on, on the day of three. So this fellow will need transplant. And for on day three, patient admitted with score of five to one will not need a transplant. And we found they actually in both cohorts, right, the uh, ARO, ARO area under the curve is quite high, about 0.9 in both derivation and validation cohort. And when we tested the predicted and observed death using a, a good feed of the model, we can see both curves overlap very closely in both derivation and validation cohort. Obviously, this become an important prognostic marker, but things change. So we also saw the dynamicity of the MELT or King's College criteria and saw that over three days period, the diagnostic accuracy is best if you have for the alpha in comparison to the other standard score, which is followed. Particularly, this is in Indian patients, I agree. Then ammonia in acute and chronic liver failure and acute decompensation of cirrhosis, where its role is very doubtful and questionable, and the literature was not very clear. Now, if you see, this is another study which was done jointly at Ames, New Delhi, as well as University College of London by Dr. Jalan and us. And you can see the number about 300 from Ames and about 200 patients from uh, uh, UCL. And if you see all these patients with cirrhosis with acute decompensation had a 28 days mortality, 43%, who are in the, indeed ACLF. Because acute decompensation with organ failure or high mortality we define as ACLF. Now, if you see the baseline ammonia in these two cohorts are uniformly predicting severity of encephalopathy. More severe the encephalopathy, higher level is the ammonia. It can also show that those who died has significantly higher level of ammonia than those who survived. And it was identified in multivariate analysis that it was an independent predictor of 28 days mortality. And this study could identify a cutoff level of about 79.5 micromole per liter as the cutoff level for predicting mortality. And with this level, 28 days mortality in those patients who has more than 79.5 micromole per liter, 
as a mortality of 61.5 in comparison to those who have less as a mortality of 26.6%. And it was also seen that those patients who had higher baseline ammonia, they have higher frequency of organ failure, which is ACLF. And so any patient with acute decompensation with cirrhosis have a high baseline pneumonia. You can predict that he is going to develop an organ failure, which classically described into acute and chronic liver failure. In this study, five days ammonia following acute liver failure study was also done. And it was seen if it persisted above this level, about 79.5 micromole per liter, more people died. Whereas if it improved, almost half of them died. Uh, the death rate become almost half, reduced significantly. So this was the first study where in acute decompensation, the baseline pneumonia value was shown. This was shown, similar things is shown in the graph, which I just described in short. And then it was seen that in particularly ACL, and some patients of acute decompensation were added, included in this study. You know, ACLF today, probably in Europe, United States, and many parts of the world are classified depending upon CLIFC ACLF scores, which has been described by ESL groups and uh, Dr. Jalan and uh, other people. And uh, uh, we, uh, they have low risk and high risk. And when baseline Lebonia was evaluated in this study in the low risk and high risk, and it was seen that if ammonia levels are high, and persisted, the mortality rate is much higher in both low risk and high risk. So ammonia level can further substratify the severity of cliff C ACLF score to prognosticate the outcome. And you can see in such patients, uh, all the patients of this group, it ammonia uh, level uh, declined or low, the survival, if it is uh, progressed, uh, uh, depending upon the degree of uh, progression, uh, uh, the survival uh, is, and, but it is progressed persistently and increase above the cutoff level, then uh, the death rates are highest. And it also documented this study, the uh, persistent ammonia elevation in acute decompensation results in organ failure. And those with ACLF who have no organ failure, if ammonia is raised, they later develop organ failure. So this was another study. This was further validated by uh, a APSL, uh, ACLF Research Consortium Group, which is a multicentric study, which was published in 2021, where there was uh, about 3,000 patients of acute and chronic liver failure, where they had shown that hepatic encephalopathy is an important marker of outcome in ACLF. And uh, peace people with those who didn't have baseline encephalopathy, but developed uh, encephalopathy, this is grade one and grade two, this is advanced encephalopathy, the uh, survival decreased. And uh, same thing if patient admitted with early encephalopathy, uh, if it is uh, improved and if it is progressed or become very advanced. And uh, also in advanced encephalopathy, if it is improved, so encephalopathy was very important uh, as an outcome, uh, outcome for ACLF they found. Very interestingly, they found there are two scores which could predict the progression of encephalopathy or occurrence of encephalopathy at uh, baseline. That is the ARC score, which complies, uh, comprises of four criteria. ARC is APSL, ACLF Research Consortium score to prognosticate patients with ACLF which comprises of hepatic encephalopathy, INR, lactate, and creatinine. Total score is 15. Each is given three score depending on the value. And they found R score more than nine. And baseline ammonia level more than 85 micromoles per liter could predict hepatic encephalopathy. And if the ammonia level increases over seven days by 60% period, period, they die. So a single value of ammonia and they are kinetic even in the severe disease of ACLF, could predict outcome and can be immediately subjected to transplant or other therapy. Now, coming to the advanced compensated cirrhosis, 
and particularly it is be believed amongst clinician there is no point in doing ammonia in advanced compensated cirrhosis because it doesn't indicate or prognosticate anything it doesn't correlate neither with onset of encephalopathy or organ failure or their mortality or their hospitalization but if you see this is a multicentric study published only last year from two center from uk and one center from spain and this data was validated in another center of Spain. And if you can see, they have collected various forms of ammonia from various sources. One arterial, venous, venous, and venous ammonia. And it was believed today that the arterial ammonia is more important than the venous ammonia. The techniques are also different. So what they did in this group of patients, they found, they found a corrected level of ammonia. That is the ratio between upper lim limit of ammonia in their lab versus actual value to make it a ratio or uniform across the center because that ratio will probably reflect much better evaluation of future outcome in each center. And they had followed up this patient till death or liver transplant and the outcome was measured. A two outcome measures were there, liver-related complication, that is a composite liver-related complication, which included bacterial infection, acute varicell bleed, overt hepatic encephalopathy, new onset or worsening of ascites, and overall survival. And they could, from the statistical method, found out that actually 1.4 times of this ratio, that is ratio between upper limit of normal and the real value, could predict or discriminate patients with low, as low risk and high risk for liver-related complication and also for overall survival. So this is the first study in chronic liver disease, right, with stable outpatient cirrhosis in a prospective cohort, in a multicentric way, could validate that indeed ammonia can predict death as well as liver-related complications. And they found a single value of ammonia in comparison to child score or male score is better for predicting one year hospitalization complication, even though one year survival was almost similar. So this was important. And they validated in another data set. And uh, that is the another Spanish center where independently they validated this data set as far as outcome and survival is concerned. And uh, this was uh, from Spain and UK. This is another center from Europe, which immediately followed up this and used stable OPD cirrhotic and retrospectively analyzed, which contained all types of uh, uh, liver disease, uh, compensated advanced as well as decompensated liver disease. And they had a median follow of 41 months, endpoint were death or decompensation. You can see this ratio, they divide into four quadrants depending upon the uh, ammonia value. And you can see as the ammonia value even slightest in increase, the liver-related uh, death increased and hepatic decompensation increased. And they also verified that this 1.4 times, right, uh, the uh, ratio of uh, upper limit versus the real value is validated in another center, which was uh, uh, reported by earlier UK and Spanish. They further could uh, correlate with the CTP scores, male score, and HBPG, as well as clinical stages. And uh, the other marker also study. This is a German study, which followed these studies, these two studies, and they found, they just uh, analyze ammonia upper limit or lower limit, or below the normal level, and found those who had upper limit, more than upper limit normal, irrespective of the degree of rise, right, six month and one year hospitalization rate is significantly higher than those who are within or less than upper limit of law. This is another center. So multiple studies within this last one year documented that ammonia, even in chronic liver disease, could predict the liver-related outcome, hospitalization, and future complications. And this same German study also found that ammonia could predict first episode of encephalopathy in such patients. We know in patients with cirrhosis, those who has first episode of encephalopathy has higher chance of recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. And in such patients, 
right you can prevent actually first episode indeed there are two rcts only lactulose and a probiotic called vsl3 has been found to be significantly better to prevent hepatic encephalopathy first episode in those who have raised ammonia even more than upper limit of nabo now based on this this is again a multicentric study because there are other variable like male sex diabetes uh, and liver function and renal dysfunction which determines outcome in cirrhosis they combine with ammonia to form a ammon overt hepatic encephalopathy model and could divide all patients with cirrhosis outpatient cirrhosis into high risk low risk and medium risk so the ammonia can be used to stratify patients with cirrhosis who are see coming to the opd as patient with a low risk moderately or high risk to develop liver related complications hospitalization even the mortality and one can always follow this patient more closely we know that the cause of uh, uh, rise in ammonia in all these three type of cirrhotics uh, are many multiple we know that there are lo loss of functional reserve uh, resulting in urea cycle dysfunction variceal bleed can increase ammonia level and uh, uh, blood urea level gut microbiome change more urease producing bacteria photosystemic shunt bypassing the liver even though there is adequate liver reserve exist and uh, uh, ammonia has been shown to upregulate myostatic gene and uh, 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 also uh, uh, resulting in less glutamine conversion and multiple effects of ammonia has been already documented that it prevents hepatic reg further regeneration aggravates sarcopenia uh as hsc upregulation neutrophilic dysfunction which we know phenotypically manifest as perpetuating fibrosis sepsis sarcopenia as an important outcome of survival and hepatic regeneration is very important now coming to the fatty liver disease uh we know we see patients of fatty liver disease in a cross sectional manner either as inert fat or with non non alcoholic steatohepatitis or with non alcoholic steatohepatitis with fibrosis and patient with f2 fibrosis progress has more mortality more liver related complications now what is the cause of uh, the link which actually turns fatty liver to the nas or fibrotic nas a many many hypotheses like uh, inflammatory cytokines oxidative stress lipotoxicity has been postulated even gut microbiome has been postulated but uh, uh, probably multiple heat theory has been uh, suggested that it is not one the uh, heat the which causes this progression now ammonia is the new kid in the block uh, probably uh, has been hypothesized that it may be another important factor in causing progression of uh, steatotic liver disease uh, from fatty liver simple fatty liver disease to nas and fibrotic nas now the reason why uh, this has been postulated because it has been documented and uh, this is just, uh, this was a recent report by esl group and i will say uh, that in fatty liver disease uh, the accumulation ammonia leads to inflammation stellate cell activation and fibrogenesis and uh, this may be the missing link they suggest because the hypoth and this has certain things has been documented as i su suggested from the very beginning there is increase in liver fat the lipotoxicity has been documented in animals actually to cause epigenetic changes in carbamyl phosphate synthase and ornithine transcarbamylase which i showed in the first slide which are very important step to convert gut derived ammonia into the urea through the urea cycle once there is a genetic mutation pro actually epigenetic mutation the functionality of these enzymes are compromised as a result there will be urea cycle dysfunction and increase intrahepatic ammonia this intrahepatic ammonia might be causing hs upregulation and fibrotic nas so this has been added to all these other uh, form of candidates which has been postulated as a candidate for progression of nas and this is what in the cartoon i have shown that this dysfunctional enzymes because of lipotoxicity result in ammonia causing hsc upregulations indeed in summary i will say ammonia is toxic to human body and rise in blood ammonia have deleterious effect on brain functions and structure 
cause immune dysfunction, can cause sarcopenia, prevent liver regeneration, and perpetuate hepatic fibrosis through HSC stimulation. Liver is the main organ which disposes ammonia through urea cycle mechanism. Therefore, in liver failure, ammonia disposal due to compromised liver reserve is reduced. And in ALF, particularly sudden and rapid rise of blood ammonia and its dynamic change depending upon liver regeneration have been correlated with outcome and have been used to construct a prognostic model, which we call as acute liver failure early dynamic model. And in acute um, chronic liver failure, raised blood ammonia has a single parameter have been found to be associated with complication and mortality, makes life simple. And I showed ARC study, which is 3000 ACLF patients and other studies as well. And in stable outpatient cirrhosis, I showed you the data from UK, Spain, Germany, and other European study, studies that it could predict liver related hospitalization frequency as well as mortality. In cirrhosis, there are many causes like photosystemic sunt gut dysbiosis, sarcopenia not utilizing ammonia to form glutamine, reduction in hepatic reserve contribute to raised blood ammonia. However, while in ALF and ACL, absolute value of raised blood ammonia in a particular lab in a particular center has been correlated with the outcome. In cirrhosis, it is the ratio which is the predictor. That is the upper limit of normal by actual value of ammonia is the predictor, right? As the ammonia value increases, the ratio decreases, right? And sometimes it will become negative. Liver disease, lipotoxicity induced epigenetic changes, particularly in carbamyl phosphate synthase and ornithine transcar carbamylase, very important enzymes in urea cycle as documented in animal models, have been hypothesized as the cause of intrahepatic rise in ammonia, inducing HSC proliferation and fibrogenesis and progression of fatty liver disease to fibrotic mass, and therefore may be a target of therapy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shown across the liver disease how liver dysfunction is very important for uh, uh, lack of ammonia disposal, causing both rise of intrahepatic ammonia as well as circulating blood ammonia, which ammonia which is used for amino acid homeostasis cannot be right disturbed when suddenly is raised or even gradually raised. This homeostasis is disturbed, causing multiple organ dysfunction, and in combination, they cause liver related outcome and mortality. Thank you very much.